slide show uh, can you able to see my uh, screen can you change the screen sir change yes like this uh um able to see the screen please yes sir uh, i just want to run the screen yeah it's moving freely sir is moving freely yeah yes sir yes sir uh one minute i uh, have some problem with uh, yeah it's moving freely yeah okay yes, sir video is also playing okay uh um, so let me introduce you sir then we can start with the lecture okay so good evening to all and uh, uh, apologies for the technical glitch and the delay in starting this session uh, myself dr madan mohan working as a consultant anesthesiologist in ganga hospital kaimthur india and i take privilege to introduce my senior as well as my teacher dr venkateshwaran uh, who is a senior consultant and head of the anesthesia team uh, uh, which is providing anesthesia to plastic surgery and microvascular reconstructive surgery sir is being associated with the ganga hospital for the past two decades and his uh, area of interest are on arrival block and uh, resuscitation of uh, uh, trauma patients and he has delivered many national as well as international talks and he has done many workshops all over the world and uh, he is a master in giving lumbar pulses block i uh, personally have learnt a lot from him and uh, today session is going to be a absolute nutcracker so i request all the participants to uh, remain mute and at the end of the session we can have a uh, discussion as well as uh, whatever uh, queries you have we can discuss with sir and uh, he'll he'll be pleased to clarify the doubts uh, over to dr venkat sir thank you sir uh, thank you madan for your kind words and uh, um, i'm going to start my uh, topic today it's the uh, lumbar plexus block and good evening everyone uh, uh, so i'm going to start my talk uh, lumbar plexus block with the uh, case scenario so we had a patient who is 55 year old male with gangrene of the left leg and his sugars were 540 mg and his hpa1c was 11% and he was having a diabetic nephropathy with a urea of 19 and creatinine of 3.6 and he was also having an ischemic heart disease with an ejection fraction of only 30% and a lot of uh, left ventricular dysfunction was also there so the plan was to do a left ebony amputation since the patient was having mild sepsis it was considered as a semi emergency so what do you do for this progress. patient so what do you what to do for this uh, uh, this thing is um so we uh, um so we did uh, this uh, procedure of left ebony amputation under uh, Uh, under lumbar and sacral plexus block which was purely a peripheral nerve stimulator guided and uh, here we can see this uh, wound was uh, uh, the ebony amputation was done and this is the uh, stump uh, of the ebony amputate and then the stump was finally closed so this whole procedure was done under lumbar sacral plexus block and he was patient was hemodynamically stable throughout the procedure why lumbar sacral plexus block for these type of individuals with a lot of comorbid illness because lumbar and sacral plexus block if you give it gives a complete anesthesia to the lower limb and there is no hemodynamic disturbances even when the ejection fraction is only 30% and there is no hemodynamic disturbances even if the patient has got a severe diabetic autonomic neuropathy and the more advantage is with lumbar and sacral plexus block we can apply a tourniquet and operate we can avoid bleeding and even with patient with mild sepsis is not a problem to give a block and more important thing is it gives a good post operative pain relief for more than 8 hours so once we uh, just control the blood sugar to 200 and we started operating and then the patient was hemodynamically stable throughout the procedure and the patient uh, was fine in the post operative period later he was discharged home after one week so this is the case scenario for this patient i hope that uh, last webinar you have mastered about how to do a sacral plexus block so today this lumbar plexus so combining both lumbar and sacral plexus block for this patient makes a complete anesthesia for the lumbar limb so let us go into this lumbar plexus block the history what the history says is in it was started in the year 1974 by winnie so he did this lumbar plexus block by landmark 
technique. And later in 1976, Tan modified and he did it as a loss of resistant technique. And it was in the year 1989 where Parkinson did the lumbar plexus block with uh, peripheral nerve stimulation. But there was some risk of renal injury uh, in this patient because he has gone at the level of L3. Later in the year 2002, and it was Capdevela who modified this Vinny's approach by going one centimeter medial to the point of insertion. And it was in the year 2002, Pandin did a lumbar plexus block and it was quite, quite medial in its approach. And it was in the year 2001 where Kirchmeier did the first ultrasound guided lumbar plexus. This is the specific history about lumbar plexus block. And coming to the anatomy, you can see the lumbar plexus is formed by uh, the anterior primary rami of nerve roots from L1, L2, L3, and L4. It also takes a branch from T12, and then uh, and this L4 and L5 will join to form what is called lumbosacral trunk. Now, this, all this lumbar plexus is formed from L1 to L4. They enter into the sovos major muscle. So this is the sovos major muscle. And uh, all these nerve roots join to form the lumbar plexus. The lumbar plexus is formed within the uh, sovos major muscle. And once it gets formed, later all the branches come out on either side of the sovos major muscle. So that's what we are going to see. So this is the cadaveric uh, dissection which was done. Uh, it's a picture of a cadaveric dissection. I can see this is the sovos major muscle. When they cut the sovos major muscle, they can find out the hole of lumbar plexus within the muscle. And this is a picture. They gave a lumbar plexus block with local anesthetic and contrast, and they found out the whole sovos major muscle was uh, uh, was uh, with, with contrast, and you can see the whole sovos muscle got soaked with the contrast. What are the branches of the lumbar plexus? There are six branches are there. There is uh, iliohypogastric, ilioinguinal, genitofemoral nerve, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of eye, femoral nerve, and obturator nerve. So these are all the six branches of uh, lumbar plexus. And when you see this uh, sovas major and the lumbar plexus branches, how they come out, you can see this is the sovas major muscle. And what you see, these are all the nerves which are coming out through the lateral border of the sovas major muscle. For example, this is the iliohypogastric nerve, ilioinguinal nerve comes at the lateral border. And also this is the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of thigh, which comes from the lateral border of the sovas major. And this is what the uh, femoral nerve, which comes out of the lateral border. And uh, we can see this genitofemoral run nerve runs over the superficial border of the sovas major muscle. And uh, the more important thing is, this is the operator nerve, which is the only nerve which comes at the medial border of the sovas major muscle. So, and this is the quadratus lumbar muscle, and this is the iliacus muscle. So, we can see how the branches come out, and they come out from the sovas major, they run through the posterior abdominal wall and they come down below the inguinal ligament and reach the uh, lower limb. This is how the nerve courses. Coming to the dermatome supply of the lumbar plexus, you can see the lateral aspect of the thigh is supplied by the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve and the anterior and medial aspect of the thigh is supplied by the femoral nerve. And the middlemost aspect of the inner thigh is supplied by the operator now in the mid part. And in the upper part of the thigh, the medial as well as middle part, and the upper part of the thigh is supplied by ilioinguinal and iliogenitofemoral nerves. And you can also see the saponous nerve, which is a branch of femoral nerve, supplies the medial aspect of the leg and also the medial aspect of the This is the dermatomal supply of lumbar plexus. And coming to the myotome, and the lumbar plexus supplies the quadriceps uh, muscles of the thigh and it also supplies the fascia lata and it also supplies the medial aspect of the thigh muscles as the adductors of the thigh. And coming to the osteotome, the lumbar plexus in the form of femoral and obturator now supplies the uh, entire uh, femur along with the head as well as the knee joint and it also supplies the superior and inferior pubic rami of the pelvis. So this is the osteotome supply of the lumbar plexus. And uh, uh, coming to the uh, 
coming to the sonar anatomy of the uh, lumbar plexus and this lumbar plexus sonar anatomy if you want to see we have to use what is called as the low frequency curvilinear probe and we have to keep the low frequency curvilinear probe and just 4 cm from the spinous process of the uh, I mean spine from the spinous process 4 cm lateral to the uh, spinous process the patient in the lateral position and once you keep it we can see the uh, we can see the uh, mean sono anatomy so this is what once you keep it here with an ultrasound we can see the structure which is the retroperitoneal structure this is the kidney which which always moves with the respiration and this is above uh, l3 level and once you come down then we can be able to see the a uh, transverse process here and uh, and we can see these are all the transverse process l3 l4 and l5 transverse process and uh, this is the transverse process what you see with an ultrasound and what you see here is the erector spinae muscle and in between the transverse process we can see the psoas major muscle the psoas major muscle what you can see is anterior two third of psoas this is anterior and this is posterior you can see the anterior two third of the psoas major muscle is a, is a muscular part and the posterior one third of the psoas major muscle is a tendinous part so the uh, lumbar plexus will be lying between the anterior two third and posterior one third so somewhat over here the lumbar plexus will be lying and what you see down is the retroperitoneal space so as you see this uh, this uh, lumbar plexus this transverse process of uh, this area we can see it almost looks like what is been called as the trident so this is what's called as trident so it almost it looks almost like a trident so it is called as the trident sign so this is the sonar anatomy of lumbar plexus in the longitudinal scan and let us come to the sonar anatomy of lumbar plexus in the uh, uh, in the by using the shamrock method so what you see is uh, so what we do is we just keep the uh, same low frequency curvilinear probe just above the iliac crest in the patient in the lateral position and uh, what you see in the ultrasound will be the Uh, picture so we can see this on anatomy and the where you can see once you keep it uh, over the uh, just above the iliac crest lateral portion what you see will be this is the transverse process of the vertebra and uh, what you see here is this the body of the vertebra and uh, this is the uh, iota and the ivc and uh, you have seen three muscles uh, from the transverse process you can see the one which is posterior is the erector spinae muscle and one which is arising from the tip of the transverse process is the uh, quadratus lumborum muscle and the one which is present anterior to the transverse process is the psoas major muscle and what you see in the behind this is these are all the uh, dural structures this is all the dural structures and what you see these are all the muscles are the anterior abdominal muscles like internal external oblique internal oblique and the transverse abdominis and then we see the dual dual muscle and the psoas major muscle and the erector spinae so in this psoas major muscle what you see is they divide this into four parts like like you just draw a vertical line and a horizontal line and the lumbar plexus will be lying close to the transverse process and it will be uh, in the medial part of what the four quadrants what you have made the medial and the inferior quadrant of what the uh, mean uh, what uh, this thing you have made so the, this is this lies the uh, this is what the uh, sonar anatomy of the lumbar plexus and uh, and this uh, and, and we can also see this uh, uh, where we can see the once you put a color doppler we can see the ivc and the iota and uh, this picture almost looks like a face of a bunny so that's called uh, the bunny this is almost looks like a face of a bunny so this is what happens when you see about the lumbar plexus uh, in, in the uh, sonar anatomy by shamrock method and uh, this muscles what you see the dual and the erector spinae and psoas major and with the staff this almost looks similar to what is called as the shamrock leaf so the shamrock leaf has got three uh, leaves and uh, this almost looks like the psoas this is this, this is almost like a psoas major and the skewel looks like this part of the leaf and erector spinae will be like this with a stalk as the transverse process this is what we can call it as a shamrock sign in say and more important thing when you see the sonar anatomy the anterior border of the vertebra will have lot of uh, blood vessels so they are nothing but the lumbar veins and arteries 
So the lumbar arteries, they arise directly from the abdominal aorta. So you have to be very careful that once this gets punctured, you can see all these vascular structures are the lumbar uh, veins and the arteries. If it gets punctured accidentally, it can produce a large concealed hematoma and also a hypovolemic shock. This is the one which we have to be very careful and we can see all of them will be lying close to the uh, vertebral body. So what are the indications of this lumbar plexus block? So when you combine with the sacral plexus, this lumbar and sacral plexus block forms the sole anesthetic for the entire low limb surgeries. And it can be used as a perioperative management of total hip replacement, total knee replacement, and also for knee surgeries. And even above and below knee amputation, as I said in the case scenario, with patients with multiple comor comorbid illness with low ejection fraction and severe LV dysfunction, and even with mild sepsis, we can go ahead and do with lumbar plexus block. Patients with a severe diabetic autonomic neuropathy, we can do lower limb surgeries with lumbar plexus block. And uh, where, where we can see all the neuraxial anesthesia for all the severe autonomic, uh, diabetic autonomic neuropathy will end in severe hypotension and a uh, and lot of system hemodynamic uh, disturbances will happen when you go for a neuraxial uh, uh, I mean anesthesia. So, so the safest is to go for a lumbar and sacral plexus block. And even fever and tibia nailing can also be done with lumbar and sacral plexus. So, these are all the main indications of uh, lumbar plexus block. Then the contraindications for the lumbar plexus block are the absolute contraindications are on a patient refusal, the local anesthetic allergy, local skin infection, and also coagulopathy. And the relative contraindications are if they have a prior retroperitoneal surgery and a progressive indeterminate neuropathy of the lower limb is also a contra relative contraindication for lumbar plexus block. And uh, should know how to identify the lumbar plexus block. So this lumbar plexus can be identified by three methods. One is by loss of resistance technique. The second one is by peripheral nerve stimulation by using PNS alone. And the third one is dual method. That is where we can use both peripheral nerve stimulation as well as ultrasound. And we combine both. That is called the dual mode. So this loss of resistance technique is nowadays it is not then so these are the two techniques which are usually done, that is PNS and also dual mode. We are going to discuss about both the techniques now. First, we'll discuss about the lumbar plexus block by peripheral nerve stimulation technique. So how do we do this uh, lumbar plexus block by PNS guidance? So the general considerations, what you need is, you need a consent, we need an IV access, and uh, the standard monitoring what is needed will be a non-invasive blood pressure, an ECG monitor, and a pulse oximeter. And the patient always needs a light sedation in the form of fentanyl and midazole because it's a deeper block and it has to be entirely as a sterile technique. These are all the general considerations. The equipment needed are the sterile marker pen and sterile scale and a 2 ml syringe with uh, uh, I mean plain, plain lignocaine. And we'd also need a 20 ml syringe with a 10 centimeter stimiplex needle and a sterile cup with local anesthetic. What we take is 20 ml of 0.5% BP vacant is taken as the local anesthetic for giving the lumbar plexus block. And of course, we need a peripheral nerve stimulator for this uh, technique. So the position of the patient will be, the patient will be in the lateral decubitus position with a slight forward tilt and the patient should be given a mild sedation in the form of fentanyl and metasolone. So this is the exact position of the patient. So now we'll go into the technique. So the patient has to be connected to the monitor. We can see all the monitors being attached and, the, and it is draped in the back because it's extre extremely a sterile technique. And once it is painted and draped, we check the uh, nerve stimulator needle with uh, local anesthetics. You just flush and keep it. And the most important thing is landmarks. First, you mark the posterior superior iliac spine, which looks like a small dimple in the Back. So this is the posterior superior iliac spine. And the next you have to mark the upper border of the iliac crest. So once you mark it, we can see this, uh, it comes and joins with the SIS, that's posterior superior iliac spine. So from, the, uh, uh, from this iliac crest, you draw a line perpendicularly down where it meets with the upper border of the iliac crest of the opposite side. This is called what is called as the intercrystal line. And then third, we have to mark the uh, spinous process line, that's the mid-spinal line. And then finally, you just mark a line perpendicular from the PSIS 
where it meets the intercrystal line so this is the one which is very important so this is the point of insertion for lumbar plexus and usually this point is about 4 cm from the midline it indicates the uh, tip of the transverse process uh, of the patient so this is usually 4 cm from the midline so this is the point of insertion from psis line and the intercrystal line this meeting point is the point of insertion for lumbar plexus you give good local uh, anesthetic infiltration and where you can see the skin and subcutaneous tissue is infiltrated after that use the uh, pns uh, needle you keep the current as 1.5 milliamps and you introduce the needle perpendicular to the skin and slightly parallel to the table ot table as you go inside by 3 to 4 cm you will be able to hit a bony uh, bony mark that is nothing but the transverse process we can see we have we got a resistance there that is because of the uh, transverse process and once you hit the transverse process then we have to go uh, either cephaloid or caudal the needle has to go either cephaloid or caudal and once you go uh, cephaloid or caudal and you will be able to reach the lumbar plexus and the plexus will be situated 1.5 to 2 cm from the transverse process and you can see the patient is having a good quadriceps twitch at 1.5 milliamps and then later we have to reduce the current from 1.5 milliamps and we slowly reduce it and uh, you still we are getting a good quadriceps twitch and once it reach between 0.3 to 0.5 milliamps and if we get a good quadriceps twitch and that is an end point for the lumbar plexus then you can see that it's still there at 0.5 and you start aspirating and injecting the uh, local anesthetic so every 2 ml you aspirate we just look for any blood tap and then you inject the local anesthetic you have to be this has to be done very carefully and uh, it's very important that uh, this matters so this is how a lumbar plexus block is given and we give about 25 ml of local anesthetic and uh, this is what the technique what we did is called vinis technique of pns guidance because we got into the point between the line drawn from psis and the intercrystal line so there is another technique which is called as cap de velos technique where we go 1 cm medial to this point of insertion of vinis technique that is called as a cap de velos technique both the techniques are very good for uh, doing lumbar plexus block with pns guidance so the main goal in lumbar plexus block is The, the distance of the transverse process to the lumbar plexus is always 1.5 to 2 cm it is the same for thin patient and this 1.5 to 2 cm is same for very obese patient also so this this lumbar plexus is situated 1.5 to 2 cm from the transverse process so don't go beyond 2 cm from the transverse process and you will end up in some problem of injuring any abdominal visceral structures so don't go beyond 2 cm from the transverse process so you always start uh, current with 1.5 milliamps with 0.1 milliseconds and 2 hertz in the uh, peripheral nerve stimulator look for visible or palpable twitches of quadriceps muscle between 0.3 to 0.5 milliamps the possible depth of the needle will be 6.6 to 8 cm depth you will be able to reach the lumbar plexus the volume what we give is 20 to 25 ml of 0.5% bupivacain in pediatrics it is 0.7 ml per kg of drug is given for lumbar plexus block so this is what been uh, been given by uh, by dr sandeep devan is a pioneer in giving lumbar plexus block and from his book we have taken so about 0.7 ml per kg is been used for the uh, pediatrics and assessment of the block so the onset time for lumbar plexus block is it usually takes 15 to 20 minutes the first sign of onset of the block is loss of sensation over the saphenous region and also there is a pain relief on the rotational movement of the knee and the patient is not able to extend the blocked leg or if the patient develops a quadriceps weakness that means the lumbar plexus block has already started so this is how to assess the lumbar plexus block and uh, we can see this patient is not able to move the uh, the blocked limb whereas he moves the opposite limb up so this means and also we check for femoral nerve and lateral femoral cutaneous nerve of thigh which are all the branches of the uh, lumbar plexus block so the patient was totally pain free in this region after testing and uh, this confirmed that lumbar plexus block has taken and we started proceeding for the surgery so 
Next, uh, we'll move into the second technique that is lumbar plexus blocked by dual mode, that is by using both ultrasound as well as peripheral nerve stimulator. So this we can be done in three approaches. One is the paramedial sagittal scan at transverse process level and paramedial transverse oblique scan at transverse process level. And the third one is the Shamrock method. So uh, as you see the three methods, the best method is to do is the Shamrock method. This is what I'm going to uh, discuss now. So by Shamrock method, by dual method, so what we do is the first thing what we need is we have to prepare the ultrasound probe in a sterile way. So what we use is this uh, low frequency cavilinear probe is been uh, made sterile and it is uh, put inside the sterile camera cover, which has been used for the laparoscopic uh, instruments. And then we just, uh, uh, and we just uh, keep the low frequency cavilinear probe uh, just above the uh, iliac crest in the patient in the lateral position. So this is how we have to prepare uh, for a dual mode. It has to be extremely sterile, and because it is a, uh, because because it is a, because it is a deeper plexus block, and the patient will also be diabetic and all these things. So you have to be very careful. Any problem with uh, sterility, any uh, in testing to the sterility can result in an abscess formation, especially in this all this comorbid illness patient. You will be very careful. So how we do with the Shamrock method is as you draw a line like what you draw for the PNS guidance and then you give a good local anesthetic infiltration over the point where it meets the line from ESIS and also the intercrystal line. You give a nice uh, local skin and subcutaneous tissue, you keep the probe just above the iliac crest and then you see the sono anatomy of the lumbar plexus where we can see the transverse process. And then this is the quadratus lumborum, and this is the sovus major muscle, and, and this is the erector spinae muscle. This is the transverse process. So lumbar plexus will be somewhere over here. And uh, so once you see the son anatomy very well, then you start inserting the needle at exactly at the point where the two lines meet, like what we give for a PNS guidance. And once you insert the needle in this uh, in-plane technique, and we can see the needle which is coming into the sovus major muscle. We can see the giggling of the needle inside the sovus major muscle. And once it reaches near the lumbar plexus, and once the stimulation is started, then we can identify, uh, we can see this is the needle which is entering into the uh, sovus major muscle and uh, uh, quite close to the lumbar plexus where we already started uh, stimulating with the uh, peripheral nerve stimulator. And once you see this, you can see a quadriceps stitch. Once it gets stimulated as quadriceps stitch, you reduce the current to 0.5 milliamps and start injecting the drug. And if you have a good pitch at 0.5 milliamps, start injecting the drug. Once you inject the drug, we can see the lumbar plexus will get separated and it floats with the local anesthetic drug. So this is how we can do uh, the uh, lumbar plexus block by dual mode, that is by using both ultrasound as well as the nerve stimulator techniques. The advantage is because by using ultrasound, we are able to identify any vascular structures which are coming and we are able to see the tip of the needle close to the lumbar plexus and after injecting the drug, we can see the lumbar plexus uh, floats. So this, uh, this is a most confirmatory and the best uh, type of technique uh, by Shamrock method by using the well mode. And then another approach is the paramedian transverse oblique scan at the transverse process level, where instead of keeping the low frequency curvilinear probe just above the iliac crest, we drop it down and uh, the point as four centimeters from the midline, we keep the other end of the probe, where you see the point where the two lines meet, that is the line for the PSIS and the intercrystal line, the probe, the tip of the probe will be over this line. So it's slightly slanting. So the advantage of this is because as an in-plane, the needle is close to the probe, you are able to see the needle very nicely when you do in this technique. And in the same, in this approach also, you're able to, you'll be able to see the transverse process, body of the vertebra, and all the muscles can also be very nicely seen in this process, in this technique. And coming to the perineural catheters, the continuous lumbar plexus block uh, by Winnie's technique, uh, we can uh, we can use we can insert a catheter, and it's also been it can also be done as a continuous lumbar plexus block. And because the advantage is, is because of the continuous lumbar plexus block, it minimizes the need of opioids for the hip femur and knee surgeries. 
and the needle opening should be facing cephaloid whenever you use a uh, I mean continuous lumbar continuous lumbar plexus block the needle should be facing cephaloid so that once you insert the catheter inside you'll be able to see the catheter coming out of the uh, tip of the needle when it, the hub is placing cephaloid the catheters when you insert should not go beyond 5 cm from the tip of the needle to make it beyond 5 cm the catheters make kink and it's very difficult to remove it later so don't uh, thread the catheter 5 cm beyond the tip of the needle and we always need a continuous infusion of our continuous lumbar plexus block and if the patient has got a pain uh, or a breakthrough pain in the in such in such instances we have to give intermittent boluses So what we can give is we can give 5 ml of 0.1 to 5 percent butyrvacan along with a fentanyl of 2 mics per kg per ml. So once you give this as an intermittent bolus, the patient gets a good pain relief. So it is also a very limb-specific anesthesia, and it allows early ampulation and effective physiotherapy for the surgery in and also and our effective physiotherapy in the post-operative period. So these are all the main advantages of perineural catheters in the form of continuous lumbar plexus. block it makes the post operative period totally pain free and makes the patient to do effective physiotherapy thereby we can avoid a development of a deep vein thrombosis and further complications so and what are the complications of uh, uh, lumbar plexus block as you see the complications can be because of the needle puncture it can cause a direct trauma to the nerves so you try to avoid using short bevel needles and when you give an intraneural injection so suppose the current is less than 0.2 milliamps and if still you get a quarter sub switch that means you are intraneural so this is also quite dangerous don't do it below 0.2 milliamps always uh, get a twitch between 0.3 to 0.5 milliamps this is adequate for giving a lumbar plexus block sometimes the needle can even damage the abdominal viscera and uh, like uh, it can damage the kidney renal capsule it can cause renal capsule or hematoma and the retroperitoneal hematoma can also happen because of lot of lumbar veins and vessels are there and if it accidentally get punctured it can produce a concealed hemorrhage and even a hypovolemic shock in diabetic patients use of catheters can produce a sova sepsis you have to be very careful and sometimes the sova major hematoma which has happened can produce what is called as lumbar plexopathy so you have to be extremely careful so these are all the complications of needle and complications of incorrect local anesthetic placement and you can see if you place the local anesthetic is incorrectly placed then it can have an epidural spread and also a spinal spread you can see the epidural spread is quite common with 3 to 21% of the patient will have an epidural spread if the, the local anesthetic placement is uh, not placed properly and this epidural spread can produce a big hemodynamic instability in the patients where we totally want to avoid that's why we have chosen the lumbar plexus block so you have to be very careful and the spinal spread can produce a total spinal because we are injecting almost 20 ml of 0.5 percent we you can be very careful and the complications from the local anesthetic as such can produce local anesthetic systemic toxicity So these are all the main complications of lumbar plexus block. So how to avoid the complications? So we can avoid this by once you have an RCS contact in the transverse process, and it's very important. Don't insert the needle 1.5 to say 1.5 to 2 centimeters beyond the tip of the transverse process. So lumbar plexus is placed just 1.5 to 2 centimeters in front of transverse process. Don't introduce the needle beyond 2 centimeters once you reach the transverse. process and also avoid medial angulation of the needle and avoid high pressure injections and always use an ultrasound to detect the needle tip and seeing the spread of the breath in with all these uh, techniques we can avoid the complications of lumbar plexus block so to conclude and lumbar and sacral plexus block as a combined uh, uh, way it produces a sole anesthetic for the lower limb procedures entire lower limb procedures and it can be safely used in patients with multi comorbid multiple comorbid illnesses and patients with severe autonomic neuropathy uh, where this lumbar and sacral plexus block can be done safely without any hemodynamic disturbances during the surgery and the pns get at lumbar plexus block you should, should not go 1.5 to 2 cm beyond the tip of the transverse process and whenever you, we can also use perineural catheters as a continuous lumbar plexus block it is very effective for the lower limb procedures and it also helps in early ambulation and effective 
can be. So these are all important advantages. So this is how we can conclude this lumbar plexus block. Thank you for your uh, patient uh, hearing. Thank you very much for you, that sir. wonderful presentation. I've got uh, a bit of questions myself, but uh, yeah. I'd like to throw um, the, the floor to anyone who may have a question for our presentation today. Please raise your hand or um, um, type in the chat. You can read out your question if you've got any question. And uh, we can, um, I'm sure he'll be able to tackle it. So any questions, please feel free. Okay, uh, as we wait for some questions, I can maybe ask one, uh, one question myself. Um, we see so many patients who have a similar presentation to um, the one that you presented. Are you, yeah. how, how much, what is the success rate of your blocks um, when you especially compare between the ultrasound guided techniques and the landmark or PNS techniques? Yeah, we can, when you use the dual mode, like uh, using the peripheral nerve stimulator and ultrasound guidance, as combined, the success rate is very good. It's about a 95 to 100% success rate you'll be able to get. And when you use a PNS guidance, there may be some amount of sparing, like uh, something like uh, a small amount of sparing, like an operator now, or something which we can be able to manage by giving a separate uh, an operator now block as a separate one. Uh, if you have, that's what we check everything and then uh, check the sensation of the, uh, the limb and then ask the surgeon to proceed. So if there if you find any sparring, we can see the uh, what nerve supplies that area, and you can supply supplement a local anesthetic uh, in that uh, in that nerve, which helps in a good success rate. So uh, therefore, we can see when you use a dual mode, the success rate is uh, very good. Thank you very much. Uh, there seems to be a few questions in the chat. I'll read. Uh, I'll read them out. I'll attempt to read them out. Can one, sorry, can you please get sacral plexus for binary video? Okay, I'll take note of that and I'll share um, the previous presentation with you. There's a question, sir. In patients with uh, diabetic neuropathy, any change in PNS, current am amplitude, pulse width, and frequency compared to patients with uh, New, with no neuropathy. Are you able to tackle that one, Doc? Yeah, uh, yeah. So, so uh, in patients with uh, diabetic neuropathy, and uh, because it's uh, directly stimulating the plexus, we don't find any change in the current. So anything what you can get between um, 0.5 milliamps. So you can go up to 0.5 milliamps. And if you get between 0.3 to 0.5 milliamps, it is very good. And uh, you can go up to 0.5 milliamps, 0.5 to 0.6 or 0.8 in case of uh, severe diabetic patients with neuropathy. If you're not able to get a twitch up to that current, we can go. The success rate is uh, uh, good. We don't find any much change. Most of the patients with diabetic autonomic neuropathy were able to get the uh, uh, stimulus uh, um, and the uh, endpoint or the uh, endpoint between 0.3 to 0.5 milliamps. We don't find any difference in these of this. You can go up to 0.5 milliamps uh, current. Okay, uh, I don't know if I understand what uh, the next question is. He says, uh, do we need to wait if patient is on tab clopid? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's because it's a deeper plexus block. Understand what it's always mean? better to wait for a, a patient who is on clopidogrel because if the superficial uh, blocks we can be able to do with patients with clopidogrel, but whereas said lumbar plexus and lumbar and sacral plexus are a deeper plexus block, it's always better to wait for at least four days uh, uh, for these uh, patients and then you can proceed with the lumbar plexus block. And because we can see that a lot of lumbar weights and arteries are there in the psoas major and also the vertebral body, 
if if they get accidentally injured during your uh, mean uh, needling it can produce a severe hemorrhage so that's why we we always as a routinely in our hospital we just wait for four days for following clopidogrel for a lumbar plexus block but uh, the thing is it's always important that uh, it, it is it depends on what is called as the uh, mean uh, mean the, again the risk benefit ratio if you find that uh, the risk is uh, very high or a benefit is very high for the patient if it's an extreme uh, this thing we can uh, if you see that if the benefit is better for the patient you can go ahead and uh, uh, do the procedure so as far as this go ahead sorry yeah if you find the benefit is uh, better for the patient by amputating you are going to avoid the sepsis and patient becomes better if you feel then you can go ahead and do a lumbar plexus block by dual method you see there are any vascular markings be careful start stimulating and then you start injecting the drug it's always the risk benefit which always plays an important role in extremely sick patients with uh, sepsis where we can find that neuroaxial or general anesthesia is going to be a big problem for them we can safely do with a dual mode thank you very much for that response uh, we've got several questions from uh, anesthesia tv dr jayati gosh um he's asking uh incidence of last what is the incidence of last the second one the second question is how is the lumbar plexus block different from the um the 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 one we've been discussed today the lumbar plexus block okay i can uh, uh, understand the first question that is uh, have you what is the I mean uh, local anesthetic systemic toxicity uh, with lumbar plexus block so it's also uh, it's also uh, uh, it can happen it can happen if it is uh, wrongly misplaced the drug is wrongly misplaced local anesthetic systemic toxicity can happen uh, so that's why whenever you can see the, the, the we can see we always do the procedure you can so you can see that video with all the pulse oximeter uh, ecg monitor and non invasive blood pressure is connected and we are just slightly communicating to the patients while we are uh, doing the procedure and, uh, and and any change in the heart rate as you see that we can think of the local anesthetic systemic toxicity and every 2 ml what you inject we aspirate confirm there is no blood tap and then you start injecting the drug so this has to be done for a 20 ml what you so every 2 ml you aspirate and inject look at all the monitors in, in such a way we can avoid a local anesthetic systemic toxicity but it's always very very careful we always keep the 20% intra lipid uh, inside the operation theater that is very very important anything can happen at any time so if it happens then we have to use 20% intra lipid so far we are not faced the local anesthetic systemic toxicity and uh, we have to be very extremely careful in doing the procedure look for any that uh, blood aspiration in the syringe uh, whenever you uh, and after that only you have to inject the drug and keep monitoring the patient during the procedure okay it seems like and then the- another question i couldn't understand about the next question uh, you asked uh, what was the next question how is the lumbar plexus block different from ql block i think this is a quadratus lumborum block how how do, how do the two the differ yeah this uh, it entirely differs because the lumbar plexus it supplies all the uh, it is in the psoas major muscle and then it supplies all the nerves like femoral uh, obturator and it uh, lateral femoral cutaneous nerve the ilio and mulnili hypogastric so all the nerves will be blocked with uh, uh, lumbar plexus whereas quadratus lumborum block is always it's like a fascia block so uh, it won't produce that much amount of analgesia or a surgical anesthesia for a patient for uh, like what you see for a uh, lumbar plexus lumbar plexus gives a very good surgical an- anesthesia whereas uh, uh, quadratus lumborum is only used for mostly for the post operative analgesia that too it doesn't cover the entire lower limb so lumbar plexus is given for the lower limb procedures whereas there is one more uh, this thing in ql that they say ql3 where they inject the drug uh, between the uh, quadratus lumborum and the psoas major muscle sometimes the drug can enter into the psoas major muscle and produce a lumbar plexus block but it is doesn't happens with so so a ql block is entirely separate it's a different thing compared to the lumbar plexus block uh, thank you very much for that uh, response dr vinkat 
Um, looking at our time and the scheduled time for this presentation, and bear in mind that uh, we started a little bit, bit late, we'll take uh, two more questions um, yeah, and end the program. Um, one of the questions that's coming from Subramanian is uh, the incidence of uh, uh, psoas hematoma, hematoma, sorry. Then the other question has to do, again, from Anasidia TV, Dr. Saji. Uh, I'm not too sure I understand this, but I will try and uh, read it. Um, okay. This great presentation, how to address the proximal lateral incision of THR, total hip replacement, how to catch the superior clunial or lateral twigs of the subcostal at the iliac crest area. Uh, yeah, so in this case, yeah, uh, this is a nice question. This, suppose when you want to do a total hip replacement entirely under a lumbosacral plexus block, we have to give a lumbosacral plexus block. Along with that, we have to give what is called as the T12 paravertebral block has to be supplemented. So when you supplement this T12 paravertebral block, so that will take care of the area over the iliac uh, crest and where this, uh, where we do a THR. So by combining this lumbosacral plexus block along with a D12 a paravertebral block, we'll be able to do the uh, uh, THR and uh, uh, quite safely and uh, uh, without any uh, complications in a coma when a patient is in a coma but illness. Yes, is that uh, can I, this is the one? I think this is an answer that we can go for uh, the question. Of for the THR. You combine the D12 paravertebral block and you give a, along with that, you give a lumbar and sacral plexus block for TH. Thank you very much. Uh, as a host privilege, <laughs> I'll ask, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll try and uh, ask a, a question myself. Um, we This usually comes to our consultants who do a lot of children in pediatrics who may need uh, uh, such a block. Are there any special consideration if you are doing this uh, uh, this procedure in a, in a in a child? Is there anything we should consider apart from yeah, the obvious uh, uh, anesthetic dosages to bear in mind? Yeah, yeah. So in the children also, we can do a lumbar plexus block for the uh, knee and uh, uh, for the knee procedure. The procedures in the uh, lower limb, especially over the uh, thigh and also over the knee we'll be able to do with the lumbar plexus block. Uh, the thing is, uh, we can safely do with a good ultrasound. And uh, we'll be able to, with an ultrasound, because it's a children, all the structures can be very nicely seen in case of children, because uh, uh, because because of the build of the child, we'll be able to see the structures very clearly. And we can also see the uh, psoas major muscle and lumbar plexus can be clearly seen. And uh, we, can, we can carefully do with an ultrasound guidance alone, or we can use a nerve stimulator you make it as a dual mode and we can do it very uh, carefully for the children and uh, it's quite safe it can also be done and only thing when you calculate the dose of the volume of the drug what you do for a lumbar plexus block in children make it as a 0.7 ml per kg of local anesthetic so that much amount of volume is enough for uh, lumbar plexus block in children. you calculate the weight and then use only 0.7 ml per kg of the drug for a you use a dual mode and do it for the children or an ultrasound alone should be enough because you can see the structures very nicely. Okay, thanks very much, uh, uh, doctor. Um, we'll end with uh, one last comment from uh, Anesthesia TV, Dr. Saji again. It says, uh, one thought the lumbar plexus block is one intramuscular block, unlike all other fascial plane and uh, neurovascular bundle blocks. So with that, I'm sure we can uh, go on for many more minutes, uh, but uh, okay. trying to observe more um, observe time, I uh, would like to end here. And uh, I'd like yeah. to thank today's presenter. This is an excellent pre okay. presentation. I enjoyed it myself. And uh, we hope that uh, we can continue learning and start uh, practicing some of these uh, blogs yeah. um, here at our hospital. Um, so to this I'd question, like to... what we are asked, uh, Dr. Saji has asked about a little thought of lumbar plexus block is one intramuscular block. Yeah, it is uh, It is almost injecting the drug into the sovas major muscle after identifying the uh, lumbar plexus by stimulating. 
so that's what is very important uh, you enter into the sovas major muscle and injecting the drug does produce a, a good lumbar plexus block you enter into the sovas major muscle stimulate and look for the lumbar plexus by the quadriceps twitch that gives a very good uh, complete uh, block and it gives a very good surgical anal- uh, anesthesia for the patient so entire procedure can be done with lumbar plexus block it is not like other facial pain blocks the facial pain blocks are useful that they are they are very good for the post operative analgesia but as a surgical analgesia this uh, facial pain blocks are not useful so this lumbar plexus block it's almost like a muscular block you enter into the sovas major muscle stimulate the lumbar plexus and then uh, to the process i think that can answer what uh, uh, dr uh, sarji from anesthesia tv has asked i think so i have answered this question dr vipin says uh, so as compartment block that's the other name yeah initially oh. they used to call it as a sovas compartment block but uh, uh, but nowadays it has been changed as uh, purely as the uh, uh, lumbar plexus initially it was called as sovas compartment block because all the drug enters into the sovas major muscle they call it as sovas compartment block now it has been specifically uh, uh, told as the in lumbar plexus all right thank you very much um thanks again dr venkat um i'd like to apologize again for the mix up as we were starting uh, i also would like to extend uh, our an invitation to all our present- i mean participants today we have uh, different topics every other week so eh, once every two weeks we we'll have uh, uh, different presentations with different presenters on regional anesthesia and the next one is in in two weeks and uh, thanks again for our colleagues in at Ganga hospital and we look forward to continue working with you and uh, with that i think i'd like to end our discussion today thanks very much once again thank you very much for your patient listening and thanks to uh, ganga hospital where we work and also the, all the consultants and colleagues in the ganga hospital for making this program a huge success Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Recording stopped.